The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Psalm 16, verses 5 through 11. Welcome back to the Steady Anchor Podcast. I'm Luke, your host. Today, recording in front of a live studio audience. My wife is in here in the background, just sitting in the office with me. She's eating some Skittles and grading some papers. Say hi, Jess. Hi. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's a it's late Friday night. We just had a couple over from church. It was great to have some fellowship and I practice some hospitality. Uh, we're in a new space, so I may have mentioned before, we have a lot of room uh, to host people and uh, to be generous with the things that God has given us. So it's been fun having more people over and, you know, being uh, the hosts for once. So that was a lot of fun. Had some nice teriyaki chicken. Um, and now we're just going to record this episode to post for Saturday. You're going to be hearing this then. Because uh, tomorrow I'll be doing some fun things as well. Some friends are coming in from out of town. We're going to go to a pumpkin patch because it's officially October. Um, and then we have some things going on back at the summer camp we worked out for the summer. So a lot of fun stuff happening. A couple of things before we start our episode. Recently we've been doing this series through the fruits of the spirit. And today we're going to be continuing that. Talking about the fruit of joy. What that looks like. How we understand joy from a biblical perspective working through the scriptures in kind of a word study fashion. Um, we're going to try and do that well and not just kind of you know, cherry pick or over read into those various passages, uh, the meaning of the word, but try and look for application as well to encourage one another and to be edified and encouraged, stirred up into good deeds. Uh, before we do that, though, I wanted to say thanks again to Mario. It was great to be able to meet him. He is a guy who reached out a couple weeks ago. He's a recent Patreon supporter. He got to visit my church in Bourbonnais, One Seven Church. He came and uh, saw some baptisms at our service after our worship gathering. It was great to talk to him and get to know him a little bit. So, Mario, if you're listening, it was great to see you, and I hope to see you again soon, brother. As well, uh, big congratulations to Blake and Lindsay Courtright. Blake Courtright is one of the hosts of Distilling Theology, which is one of the podcasts in our network, the Society of Reform Podcasters. In these last two weeks, he's gotten married to uh, Lindsay, so congrats to them both. Wish them the best. I'm just in entering into around the fourth month of my own marriage, so it is definitely a blessing. Um, so all the best wishes to them. Also, uh, I want you to go and check out, if you can, Billings Coffee Co., my friend Grant Billings, who's also the, co the co-host of another one of the podcasts in our network, the uh, Seeker Start podcast. Grant recently started the Billings Coffee Company, and he's, I believe he's taking orders now. So if you're looking for something new, you're looking to support someone as they're getting off the ground, go and check that out. And now into the substance of today, recapping the last couple of weeks, we took a break over the summer between the episodes where we started and where we picked back up. But recently, we've been recapping the idea of the fruits of the Spirit. It's a concept that we see in Galatians chapter 5, specifically in verses 22 and 23. It's a contrast that the Apostle Paul is making between the fruit of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit, two parallels of uh, the actions and attitudes that are produced by a sinful inclination of heart and the actions and attitudes that are produced by a heart that is led and regenerated by the Holy Spirit. The actions and attitudes, the postures that we take, the way that we think and the way that we treat one another related to whether we are still dead in our sins and under Adam, still fallen and estranged from God, or if we have been born again by the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit, um, if we have been empowered to go and to live and become more and more like Christ in all that we do, um, and how we live out those fruits of the Spirit, the way that the life that is now being produced in us by the Spirit of God 
makes us to produce fruit. Like the fruit that we bear is a sign of the life that is within us. As Jesus said multiple times in the Gospels, that uh, it's not what goes into the body that defiles, but what comes out of it. He said that a good tree produces good fruit and a bad tree produces bad fruit. And so it is a reflection of what is inside. That if we are producing the fruit of the Spirit, it is a reflection of being infilled with the Spirit, indwelt by the Spirit, as opposed to producing fruit of the flesh dominantly, which is a sign of being still in the flesh. But again, we're not going to use these as kind of a paradigm to uh, uh, analyze yourself or to you know, take this so far as to start questioning our salvation because we're not obeying perfectly. That's not what I want to do here. What I do want to study here, what I do want to encourage is to look at these fruits of the Spirit, the way in which the character of God is to be exemplified in our lives, and the way that God's Spirit within us is making us more and more like Jesus, and how we can press into those things and be encouraged to live those things out well in accordance with God's Word. And so we're going to go through a lot of scripture today. It's going to be very verse heavy, but hopefully it gives us a better picture of what joy is biblically, that we would have an adequate definition, understanding, and an understanding of how that looks like in our lives, so that we'd be better able to identify and to apply it. So our passage for today, we're going to read through that section again, Galatians 5, 22 through 24, but the fruit of the Spirit is love joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law, and those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Now, in previous episodes and uh, further back and recapped recently, uh, the first of these lists is the fruit of love. Love, which from the Greek is the word agape, some people will make very fine distinctions between the different words for love in the New Testament. It's not entirely warranted because they're used almost synonymously in a lot of circumstances. Um, but it is something to say that like agape, the, the love of God towards us, the way that we're supposed to live that out is sacrificial. It is in our actions. It is a choice that we make. It goes beyond just fuzzy feelings that not only are we compelled to love one another, in true and genuine affections of our hearts, as the Spirit changes our desires, as He helps us to care for the people around us. But it's also a choice that we make. We choose to love, even when the other person doesn't seem worth loving. Just as God in Christ has loved us and died for us, even when we did not deserve it. That even while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That greater love has no one than this, that someone would lay down his life for his friends. And Christ laid down his life not only for his friends, but for his enemies, to make them into his brothers and sisters. That is the love that we are to exemplify. And in Christ also, do we see the fullness of joy? In relationship with Christ, do we see and find the fullness of joy? Joy in the scriptures comes from the Greek word kara which refers to happiness or joy as we most often translate it, or a sense of delight. But it's deeper than happiness, that it's kind of one of those trite words that we talk about joy or peace or feeling hashtag blessed, however you want to say it. But it's important for us to get the understanding that though we kind of use it in a very shallow or uh, cliche way, that joy is something true and deep and genuine, something that we are meant to experience in a relationship with God, and something that ultimately God is the source of, that despite all the amazing things that he has given us in this world, despite the people, the blessings, the, the opportunities, the gifts, all of the pleasures that this world has to offer, that are good things even, as gifts of God, as common graces or special graces to his people that he has given us for our enjoyment in this life, far greater still are the joys that we find in relationship with our creator. So all of us have things that we enjoy, things that we like, things that we get delight from. Um, I get joy and enjoyment and delight from spending time with my wife because I think she's amazing and beautiful and I love just relaxing with her and watching movies at the end of the day. 
geez, sticking her tongue out at me. Uh, but it's true. It's something that I get joy from, even if we're not talking, even if we're just sitting next to each other and enjoying each other's company and relaxing. It brings a joy to me that's deeper than just a surface level happiness of contentment. Um, I am happy when I'm well fed, when I have good food. We had some good teriyaki chicken earlier. That's one of the favorite meals that I've learned how to make. Um, I love good food or mediocre food, really. Um, like a Taco Bell beef quesarito is enough to send me up to cloud nine. My wife is laughing in the background as well because she knows it's true. I am very easy to please when it comes in terms of food. Um, like a nice spam sandwich, that is a good time. Anyway, um, but like the joy that we have from our relationship with God, the joy that we find in in attending to the means of grace, the joy that we find in worshiping God with his people, the joy that we find in knowing and studying the scriptures and meditating on the law of the Lord, the joy that we find in the mutual encouragement we have with our brothers and sisters in the faith, the joy that we have in spending time praying to the God, praying to our Lord, presenting our heart's desires to him, and and asking him for wisdom and guidance and for a closer relationship with him. We know that, uh, that our relationship with God is based upon grace, it is based upon knowledge and truth, it is, it is objective, it is, uh, it is based in reality, it is set forth in doctrinal truths, but it is not just a list of facts. They are not cold and dead facts, but they are truths that make us come into a living and true relationship with a personal triune God. So we build our relationship with him. And in that relationship, in loving him and serving him and praising him and becoming more like him, there we find the fullness of our joy. It's been commonly said, it's an, one of the illustrations we use to explain this concept to the kids at the summer camp that I worked at this last summer, is that happiness is like a wave. It is circumstantial. It comes and it goes, you're up and you're down, and then it's gone, and you have to wait for the next one. Happiness, in the colloquial sense, the common understanding, is just this this positive feeling. It's, you know, that you could reduce it down to the chemicals in your brain. You're getting a, a positive chemical feedback on a certain circumstance, you know, whether it's, you know, you, you see that your crush liked your Facebook post, whatever it is. I don't know. Uh, you see a puppy, and you get this positive chemical response, and that's happiness. Well, that is good. That may be enjoyable, but that is not sustaining. That is not the, the type of deep and abiding joy that we are to find in Christ. So happiness is like a wave. It's up and it's down, and then it's gone. But joy is like the ocean itself. Though there are ups and downs, there's back and forth, sometimes it's still and sometimes it's rocky, you're still floating in the midst of this vast ocean. That is the joy that we find in our relationship with the Almighty God, the one who is infinite, the one who is beyond comprehension, whose beauty is beyond the ability of language to explain, the one who is so loving and so kind to us, so holy and so transcendent, the one who created us in his image and likeness, who gave us purpose and value, the one who has formed us in our mother's womb, the one who plotted out our days in life, the one who saved us by his sovereign grace. This is the God whom we serve. This is the God whom we love. This is the God whom we rejoice in. And going back to the Greek, the word kara, which means joy, there's a, a lexical connection there to two other Greek words. This is actually interesting because yesterday, as part of one of my classes, uh, a couple other of my classmates and I, for our homiletics class, were listening to a sermon of someone that we found online. One of the guys knew him and recommended the sermon because it was from some Lutheran megachurch from back where he grew up. Um, and the illustration that this pastor used talking about joy and its connection to grace, and we weren't really sure if he was using that correctly. We weren't sure how accurate it was, so I did some digging. And it seems like he was right to the best of what I found, that there is a root connection in the terminology between joy and grace and rejoicing. 
that kara is related to charis, joy related to grace, that joy is in some sense like the experience of grace, some have said, and that leads us to kairo, the verb to rejoice, that having joy and expressing joy in someone or something is, is to rejoice about that thing or person. That when we are rejoicing in the Lord as the scriptures command us, we are expressing the fullness of joy that we've experienced by the grace of God. Now, that may be a step too far. You could argue about, you know, the grammatical intricacies of those language, but I think it's an interesting point. But ultimately, this is something that is found in our relationship with God. This is the thing that we were created for. As the Westminster Shorter Catechism, the first question Uh, which we've quoted often on this show, if you run anywhere near our circles, or even in mainstream conservative evangelicalism, you may have heard this at least once, that the first question is, what is the chief end of man? And the answer of the Shorter Catechism is that man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. That it was the understanding of the Westminster divines of Uh, the Reformed tradition as a whole, and in many ways through all of Orthodox Christianity, uh, that our purpose as human beings, as people made in the image of God, you can explain that a lot of ways, but the way they boiled it down was that our end goal, our purpose, our telos as beings, is to enjoy God and to serve him, to, to glorify him, and the way that we live and speak and breathe, that our affections would be inflamed when we think of him, that we would be driven to rejoice whenever we consider the grace and mercy that he has shown to us, that in a relationship we would find the fullness of joy, that in glorifying him and enjoying him forever, we are accomplishing the purpose that we were made for. So this is central to our understanding, not just as Christians generally, but all of our understanding of what humanity is, that we are beings made in the image and likeness of God, and we can only find our ultimate joy and satisfaction in a personal relationship with God, which as we know from the scriptures is only through faith in Jesus Christ and a reliance on his sufficient work for us on the cross, that there is only one mediator between God and man the man Christ Jesus, who is God in the flesh, who lived a perfect life and died a sacrificial death and was raised as a confirmation of our justification, that in his life, his death, and his resurrection and ascension, he confirms to us in the message of the gospel that we are forgiven of the many sins that we have committed, of our rebellion against our Creator, and that we have been reconciled through faith in him. That as we are united to Jesus the Son by faith, so we also become sons and daughters of God. It's in John chapter 1, I think verse 12, that it says that those who received him, where it was given the right to be called the children of God. That is our joy, to be known as God's own children, and to fulfill the purpose for which we were created. So I want to run through a lot of the uses of the word uses, a lot of uses of the word joy in the scripture, kind of going from uh, the first ones all the way through the ending, and we're going to end with uh, a bit of a long reading from Revelation chapter 21, which really gives us the full picture, which gives us the end goal, the fullness of our joy in the future for those who are in Christ. We're going to start in the Old Testament, the, the book of Nehemiah chapter 8 verses 9 through 10 say this, And Nehemiah, who is the governor, and Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people wept as they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat and drink sweet wine, and send portions to anyone who has nothing ready. For this day is holy to our Lord. And do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. A beautiful phrase and a beautiful idea. In this, excuse me, in this context, in Nehemiah, this is the people coming back from exile, pretty much rebuilding the city of Jerusalem and the Holy Temple. They're pretty much just getting the walls back together. And the people, the priests, the Levites, are coming back and reading the scrolls that contain God's word, the law on them. 
And some of these people may be for the first time in their lives or in as far back as they can remember are hearing God's word read to them. And it's bringing them to tears, realizing that the way that God has provided for them in the past and also what he demands of them and, and his covenant relationship with them. And ultimately, we know from the scriptures that the promise of the Messiah, the Deliverer, who would take away our sins, even greater than all of the sacrificial system could. But in this context, they hear the words of the law and they begin to weep. But Nehemiah, the governor, Ezra, the priest, and the Levites, they say, don't weep, rejoice. Don't be grieved, but go and, and feast, rejoice, celebrate, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. A lot of the uses of joy, especially in the Old Testament, come from the book of Psalms, which is basically the hymnal, the worship book of the Old Testament people. And, you know, I think it's a good practice to at least uh, use some of these psalms as, as a pattern or to sing these words in our worship. I'm not an exclusive psalmody guy by any means, but since I've been going to Mid-America Reform Seminary, I've started to had a greater appreciation for singing psalms or psalm-based literature. We sing from the Trinity Psalter hymnal every time we go to chapel. And I think it is beautiful to hearing all of those voices of men and, and one woman studying for ministry in different capacities, all singing the praises of their God together. So that's a side note, but here is Psalm chapter 30, verses 4 through 5. The psalmist writes, Sing praises to the Lord, O you his saints, and give thanks to his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment, but his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Psalm 51, verses 7 through 12. This is King David after his sin with Bathsheba, how he had slept with her and impregnated her and then killed her husband to try and cover it up. He comes and he writes this psalm as an act of repentance, as basically writing out his cry for forgiveness. And here he says, verses 7 through 12, Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. Psalm 95, 1 says, O oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Proverbs 17, verse 22 says, A joyful heart is good medicine, but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. Also in the prophets, Isaiah 29, 19, he writes, The meek shall obtain fresh joy in the Lord, and the poor among mankind shall exult in the Holy One of Israel. Again, Isaiah 35, verse 10 and the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain gladness and joy, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Habakkuk 3.18. Uh, we did a study of Habakkuk last year, I think. Was it last year? Yeah, the fall, the summer of 2020, we did a study through the book of Habakkuk. And basically in context in these three short chapters, Habakkuk is is asking God what he will do in terms of the justice of his city. In Israel, um, he's a prophet and he's crying out to God about the injustice that he sees among his people. The poor and the widows oppressed and evil men devouring one another. And God says that what he's going to do is because he's going to bring the Babylonians to strike the city in judgment. And so Habakkuk in this book is struggling with God's judgment on his people, but in the end, he admits that what the Lord does is right. And even though his people would be punished for his sin, yet he still cries out, Habakkuk 3.18, Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. And then into the New Testament, the words of Jesus, Matthew 13.44, The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field which a man found and covered up. Then, in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Uh, the symbolism of this short parable is that the kingdom of heaven, it's like a treasure that a guy goes and finds in a field that's for sale. 
And so joyfully, he knows that what he's giving up in purchasing this field is not worth nearly as much as what he gains in the treasure of that field. In the same way, what we give up for the sake of the kingdom of heaven is of no comparing to what we find in our relationship with Christ and entering to his eternal kingdom. Luke chapter 2, verse 10, when the angels appeared to the shepherds to announce the birth of Jesus in Nazareth, and the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring to you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. That this gospel, this good news of Christ's birth, God in the flesh, God among us, his, li- his living, his dying, his rising again, and his ascending to heaven, this is good news for great joy. Luke fifteen seven. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. That there is joy in heaven, that the Father himself has joy and the angels rejoice when even one sinner repents and turns in faith in Christ. John, 5, uh, John 15, verses 9 through 11. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. Jesus, in his upper room discourse, talking to his disciples at the Last Supper, um, gives this lengthy explanation of many spiritual things, many things that are going to come. Uh, But he tells them, he encourages them to abide in his love, to stick the course, to trust in him, and to live in accordance with his teachings. He says that he has spoken these things, that his joy may be in them to the full. Not that they would be burdened down, but that they would be refreshed and renewed by the knowledge of God and the presence of the Spirit within us. The Spirit that Christ has promised to send and gives to all of us who believe in him. Paul writes in Romans 14, 17, For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Talking in the context of eating meat, sacrifice to idols and stuff like that, and dealing with the weaker brother, but realizing that ultimately with a Christian faith is not about don't drink, don't touch, don't do. It's about righteousness. It's about peace. It's about joy in the Holy Spirit. 1 Thessalonians 1, verse 4 through 6. For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you, because our gospel came to you not in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. You know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake, and you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit. Paul writes and thanks God for the Thessalonians, the believers in Thessalonica, that they were born again, that they were chosen by God in his grace, that the gospel message came to them in power, in the spirit and full conviction, and that they received it in affliction, in much suffering, but with the joy of the Holy Spirit, that each of us as believers also can have full and true joy in the spirit of God within us, despite the afflictions that we may suffer. Hebrews 10.35, For you had compassion on those in prison, and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property, since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. The author of the Hebrews, uh, encouraging his listeners that they had suffered greatly, but they had joyfully accepted it, even losing the things that they owned, that Unjust men were confiscating their property, stealing their stuff, and yet they joyfully accepted it, knowing that their life was not about their possessions, that their heavenly treasures, their life to come, was a much better one and an abiding one. Hebrews 12, 1 through 2, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. That Christ, for the joy set before him, endured the pain and suffering of the cross, the cross on which the scriptures teach us, where he not only died a physical death, 
unjustly accused of crimes he had not committed, but that he was suffering the wrath of the Father, that he was crushed for our iniquities, that he was stricken and smitten for our sins. The punishment that we deserved was poured upon him, and that by his wounds we are healed. That is the testimony of Scripture that Jesus on the cross was not just dying as a good moral example or as a, an unfortunate political sacrifice. No, he was dying a sacrificial, atoning death on our behalf. So that for all who believe in him, their sins have been paid for in full. And that the righteous life that he earned, that he lived, that righteousness is counted to us by faith. That is the beauty of the gospel. James 1 Verse 2 through 3, James writes, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you face trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, that we should count it joy as Christians, even when we suffer greatly, even when many trials of many kinds come towards us, for we know that when our faith is tested, that we grow in steadfastness. I like to quote often that, and from Romans chapter 5 that suffering produces perseverance, which produces character, which produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame. And finally, from the book of Jude, verses 24 through 25, well, there's only one chapter in Jude, he writes, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now and forever. Amen. That statement, with great joy, that it is, it is joy bringing to God himself to save us and to present us before him on the day of judgment, forgiven and free from the penalty of sin, that for the sake of Christ we are accounted to be righteous and accepted in his heavenly kingdom. That is a beautiful thing. All right, so this is just a smattering of verses that the scripture talks about joy, the, the concept behind it. And you can go into depth, into greater depth with more resources, to talking about joy and what it is and what it means for us. But I really just wanted to give you a picture of uh, some of these aspects of what it looks like, of what it means, and, and how it impacts our daily lives as Christians. That Christ is the embodiment of joy in many ways. Not that he was just always a happy-go-lucky guy. We know that he suffered greatly, that he wept and he mourned and he suffered, that he, uh, he was filled with sorrow and sadness and, and mourned over the loss of his friends and over the unrepentant sinners of his city, those whom he came to, who were his own people who did not receive him and the life that he came to offer. But we know that underneath the sadness and the sorrow, there was a deep and abiding joy that the Son had because of his abiding relationship with the Father and the Spirit, the same joy that he had possessed in relationship with them from eternity. Maybe not always easily seen or readily experienced because Christ was truly human as well as truly God and a mystery beyond our comprehension. But he was a person who exemplified joy, and he showed us, he taught us, that it was his joy to save sinners. I recently started reading the book Gentle and Lowly with a small group of my church, and my wife and I keep reading through these chapters, and over and over again in this book, um, Ortland, the author, keeps reiterating this fact that it is joy bringing to God to show mercy to sinners, that what brings Christ joy in his deepest heart is to see sinners saved, forgiven, to see, uh, to see the the per, the sorry the price that he paid in the cross come into great effect. That it delights him on earth to see sinners repent and be forgiven, just as now that he sits in heaven and still intercedes for his elect, that he still prays for us, and that he still rejoices when any one person, no matter how small or insignificant they may seem, when they turn and faith to him. It brings him joy, and it should bring us joy as well in this fellowship relationship with our Creator, that by faith in Christ we have been united to him and brought, in a sense, into this Trinitarian relationship, that through Christ we have gained access to the throne of grace so that we can go to our Heavenly Father and cry out to him in our times of need, 
to, to ask him for wisdom and provision and protection because he is a good father who loves us and takes joy in providing for us. That we should also take joy in the salvation of sinners, that we should not be vindictive and angry and proud against the people that are not so enlightened and spiritual as we are. So that we should find joy in sharing the message of hope in the gospel with those around us. And we should take joy in the fellowship of the saints, in the forgiveness of our sins, in the ordinary means of grace. That we should find joy when we go to him in prayer, when we read his word in the scriptures, when we seek his face in uh, the corporate worship on the Lord's Day, when we go to him to hear his word preached and prayed and sung, and when we sit under the sacraments, when we receive baptism, when we see baptism, when we take the Lord's Supper and remember, when we spiritually feast with Christ. That these are all things that bring us joy as Christians and individuals, but also as Christians corporately. That as a church, we are called to be a people of joy, not just a people who are always sour and dour and serious, but we can find joy in the truth that God has revealed to us, a true joy in the Spirit. It's a common critique of people in the Reformed tradition that they are very stern and austere. And part of that is for good reason. I do believe it's important to be reverent in our worship and in our living, to be serious people who are about serious business. But that also doesn't mean that we should always be, uh, we should always be killing the party, you know? Because even with uh, seriousness, even with a right understanding of reverence and these things, there is still a place for joy in the Christian life. Even as Calvin said, the scriptures forbid us nowhere to laugh. Like laughter maybe have its appropriate seasons, but that does mean it has its appropriate places. It's not always inappropriate to laugh. We are called to find laughter and enjoyment and merriment and fellowship. But that was That's at the core of what the Christian life is about. And that is the core of what the, the Holy Spirit of God wants to produce within us. That not only does he produce love and holiness and Christ-likeness, but he produces joy and joy abundantly. And so we as a church, as the people called by the name of Christ, are called also to exhibit joy. And if we lack that joy, maybe it, it's a sign of a deeper spiritual issue that we are not resting in Christ as we should be. That maybe it should be an encouragement to us to lean in more to the means of grace and to not see this as a burden. I, again, I don't want this to be another to-do list for you to do, for you to try harder and, you know, just have more grace, to have more faith, has more joy, as if trying harder is going to produce those things within you. No, rather, instead, I want to encourage you, as I have been encouraged by this study, to find joy in the triune God in fulfilling the purpose for which we were created by glorifying him and enjoying him forever. And that really is what eternity is going to be about. One last re uh, verse reference and then we'll close. This is from Revelation 21. The vision of the new heavens and the new earth. These are the verses. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. That is our hope, and that is our joy. So, I hope that was a blessing to you, and I hope to see you again 
If you have any questions or comments or concerns, feel free to reach out to me on any social media platform. I'd love to hear from you to hear how this, how this uh, series has been beneficial to you or any pushback or questions you may have. Until next time, love God, love his church, and love your neighbor as yourself. Have a joyful week.